Hey guys, welcome to the last real lesson for chapter four. And we're going to be talking today about ocean currents. You should start on page 95, um, real close to where we left off yesterday. Okay, so here's an idea for a YouTube video. You'll find these um, underneath on the Sophia lesson. Um, first, let's talk about gyres and ocean currents. All right, so ocean currents are driven by wind, the Coriolis effect, like we talked about yesterday and in our lab, continents. So the ocean currents have changed a lot since the location of the continents has changed over time as well. Think of like how different it would be in the ocean if we were just Pangea still. Um, all of the stuff here in between wouldn't exist, and these larger um, currents would be much broader, like across the whole one side of the Earth. So that would be just totally crazy. Um, they're, driven, they're driven by gravity and they're driven by temperature. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five factors are going to be driving our ocean currents. Now, um, our first type of, of ocean current is going to be a gyre, and that is a large scale pattern of water circulation. Now, there's five different major gyres in the world. Um, we have one, two, three, four, five. Now what's interesting, especially to us here in environmental science, is that um, the gyre here in the northern Pacific Ocean has actually been collecting trash from the coast of Japan and China as well as the, the western coast of the United States and has actually um, created this thing called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And we'll be talking that, about that a lot in um, chapter 16 which is all about trash but if you'd like to look at pictures of that it's pretty interesting okay and it's kind of a a real world relation of what the heck a gyre is. Okay, now gyres move clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. Of course, we know that kind of everything happens oppositely like that. So if you look, you can even follow the arrows here clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. Right? Um, Another thing you can look at if you want to go back to this figure is you can look at the fact that these arrows kind of point the same way. So even in the atmosphere, we're moving clockwise in the northern hemisphere and, well, at least these ones over here are going to move counterclockwise. Okay? So that's kind of a relationship between the air currents and the water currents. All right, our next type of um, ocean current is going to be this thing called upwelling. All right, and upwelling is the upward water motion towards the surface. So it's taking all of the stuff, all the dead stuff, all of the nutrients. Most important is going to be the nutrients. It takes everything from the bottom of the ocean up into closer to the surface. Okay, so that way the producers that are going to be living. Um, closer to the surface up here because they have to perform photosynthesis, um, they're able to um, support a larger population of fish at these areas. Like these are going to be very, very good fishing areas because we're going to have the entirety of the food chain rather than having all the nutrients at the bottom of the ocean. Well, there's no light that gets down there, so producers aren't going to be able to survive. So if you look at these little shaded zones, you see these are the upwelling zones. We have one here off the coast of um, Mexico, down here, coast of South America, Africa, North and South. So, oh, and even Australia over here. So what we need to notice about this is that they're all on the West Coast. They're all on the West Coast, so that's pretty cool. All right, now let's move over for our thermal haline circulation. Okay, now thermo it should make sense to you because it's about temperature. Okay, so thermal haline circulation is going to be the mixing of surface and deep waters. Okay, now at the same time, it's going to be moving heat and nutrients. 
Okay, so that's why up here we have um, the red lines are going to be our warmer waters, and then the cold lines is going to be the colder waters. Okay, so let's follow this real quick. Number, number one says warm water flows from the Gulf of Mexico to the North Atlantic where some of it e freezes and evaporates. Okay, so water's getting warmed up here on number one because we're real close to the equator. It's going to travel up the current up to the um, North Atlantic and some of it's going to freeze and then some of it's going to evaporate. All right, the remaining water is now saltier and denser and sinks to the ocean bottom. Now that should make sense to you because if you have um, a bunch of, you can almost think of the salt here as like macaroni. So if you make macaroni and you put, and then you're, it's on the stove and it's heating up and evaporating, okay, the more water that evaporates, the more dense the water is going to be with macaroni. Okay, so the same thing happens with salt. The more that evaporates or the more that freezes, okay, the salt isn't going to evaporate or freeze, so it's just going to be left over in whatever remaining water there is. So whenever there's evaporation or freezing, the remaining water is going to be much, much saltier. Okay, and since it's heavier, we know that thanks to our laws of density, it's going to sink. All right, the cold water is then going to travel, travel, travel along the ocean floor, among the different currents. Okay, so number three takes it up here, number three takes it up here. And the cold deep water eventually rises to the surface. Okay, so when it hits, you know, when it hits a, the coastline of a continent or something like that, it's going to rise to the surface and then circulate back to the North Atlantic where it starts all over again. So if it's hitting the continent here by India, by Australia, over here by North America, it's eventually going to lead back to the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, so oceans are all connected. There's not just the water in the Pacific Ocean never touches anything else. They all circulate constantly. Okay, so we have evaporation. Salination is um, saline, so that's salt. Whenever you think of how saline or anything something is, it's going to be salty. Um, and remember, whenever there's more salt, it's going to sink. There's going to be heat exchange. Um, then our last factor here is going to be heat transport. So hot water and cold water, okay, is going to be changing with altitude or with latitude. Sorry. Okay, so obviously the water at the equator is going to be much hotter than the water at the poles. All right. Um, now, our issue with this heat transport, it's been going on for billions of years in the ocean. We've had our currents, we've had our cold air at the bottom, we've had our warm air, I mean cold water, sorry, at the bottom, warm water towards the surface, even warmer water at the equator for billions of years. Now, thanks to our friend global warming or global climate change, the temperatures of the oceans are actually rising. Now, it's only rising by like 0.1 degree, but if you think about how much energy it would take to heat all of this water one degree, it's kind of out of this world at the amount of energy. It's just crazy. So the higher the temperature in the water, the more glaciers are going to melt. Okay, The more glaciers are going to melt, the less salty the water is going to be because now we have more water and so the concentration is, of salt is going to be less. Okay, And that can actually shut down the circulation. Like if there's not a temperature difference between hot and cold and there's not a large difference between the salty water that's coming up or the relatively fresher water that's coming up here and the salty that it becomes at number two here, um, it's going to end up shutting down this whole process, okay? Because this is how it should be. We should have upwelling, okay? Then it turns into hot water. Some of it evaporates. The remainder is salty. It sinks. It's cold. Goes to the bottom. Upwells again. So this is our cycle that's happening all the time with this 
um, global warming that's been added, it might not be the same forever. And so scientists and oceanographers have been looking at these. Another effect that this has is on the um, migration of a lot of fish and whales and sharks and, and organisms that just cannot find their way anymore because these currents are shifting. All right. So just a little bit scary. All right, last, or actually almost last, is we're gonna, let's talk about El Nino. We are in an El Nino year right now, okay? So this one is gonna pertain most to us. So let's talk about what the heck is an El Nino, okay? It's called El Nino Southern Oscillation. So it's gonna be periodic change in winds and ocean currents. Now, most years, so this top one, and I kind of recreated it here, during most years, trade winds push surface water from east to west. So trade winds, trade winds, trade winds, going crazy. We already learned about those in the last lesson. Okay, now deep water moves upward because we're upwelling over here on the west coast of South America to replace the surface water that's moved with the, with the wind. So the wind is pulling water and air in this direction. Now. It has to be replaced by something, so the colder deep water comes up and brings nutrients and all kinds of fabulous stuff to the coast of South America. Now, during an El Nino year, the trade winds are not very strong, and sometimes they even re reverse direction. Okay, so now they're going um, west to east, right? Now, this it also, if it turns completely to west to east, it's going to start pulling that surface water here too. Okay, so the warm surface water builds up along the coast of South America and prevents upwelling of the deep cold water. Okay, now that can be a problem, um, especially if you're like a fisherman and you make your living fishing off of here. If there's no upwelling, if there's no nutrients, you're kind of out of a job. Right. It happens, it usually happens like, I think it was every seven years, but it changes a lot. All right, so right now we are in an El Nino year. It actually has a severe effect on the weather all around the world. Okay, so because this, I mean, the Pacific Ocean is very, very large, and if half of it is performing strangely, okay, it's gonna have an effect all over the place. So I'm gonna add a video um, about the effects of El Nino and if you have any questions if you have any more questions about it don't don't hesitate to ask okay all right last we have um, rain shadows okay now this kind of um, is important to us because we live really close to mountains and um, it also it really affected me growing up because I used to live in Seattle all right, so let's bring this down here. Okay, a rain shadow is going to be a region with dry conditions found on the leeward side of a mountain range as a result of humid winds from the ocean side calling precip causing precipitation on the windward side. All right, so I'm going to use Seattle as an example, and we are kind of close to that, but we're more on this side of any large body of water, all right? So we're not really close to the ocean because we're all landlocked, all right? So um, the, the winds bring up a bunch of moisture from the atmosphere, okay? The, the ocean water has evaporated. The air above the ocean is gonna be really saturated with water, all right? As the winds pull this up, it's gonna, inc it's gonna rise, rise, rise in elevation, rise in elevation. This is called um, the windward side going to rise up and then eventually we're going to hit that saturation point like I said it's going to decrease again and then we're going to have a bunch of our precipitation fall okay so usually on these on the windward side of mountains is going to be super moist lush forests okay it's going to be very very green now once this air has dropped all of its precipitation, now it's cold, it's really high in elevation, it's going over the mountains, it's already dropped all of its water, so now it's dry, okay? So now this dry, cold air is traveling to the other side of the mountains. This is called the leeward side, 
okay? And then it descends, then we're having our phenomenon of adiabatic heating, okay? Remember, as it condenses, it gets warmer. And then now we're going to have um, this area right here is called the rain shadow, where it, where it causes the desert, okay? Now, I think I need to add that okay, over here. Okay, so this is their rain shadow. All right, over on this side. All right, so this happened a lot in Seattle. Seattle was right over here, so it rained a whole lot. And that's what everyone knows about Seattle. That's a space needle, in case you didn't know. All right, and please, please, please check out the YouTube videos if you're still confused and do not hesitate to ask questions. Now, I know you're probably like, Miss, there's still a bunch of chapter left, okay? We still have all this stuff about biomes, okay? And over the Labor Day weekend, you're gonna make something about biomes. So my, my um, video will not be a lesson, we'll not do sticky notes, but we're gonna make books, okay, to help us remember, all right? And I will do demonstration. I might do it in class, I might do it on a video, I'm not sure yet, okay? So stay tuned, and I will see you tomorrow.